Grab drivers and taxi uncles, oh, they love to chat. So when they pick me up at Genome or Biopolis where I work, this conversation usually takes place. They'll start by asking me, do you work here? What do you do? And then I'll reply very truthfully that I am a breast cancer researcher, and sometimes I regret. Because the follow-up question will always be, are we curing cancer yet? Now, I never have a good reply to that question because one does not simply cure cancer. What can I do, right? Now, look to your left, look to your right, be friendly, come on. Tap the seat of the person in front, turn around, smile the person at the back. There are about five of you. Now, on average, in this lifetime, one in five people will develop cancer. We don't know who, but one in five people will develop cancer. It's very common. Every day in Singapore, 40 cancer cases are diagnosed. And in other parts of the world, it can be an even bigger problem with even more cancer cases. Now, as common as it is, don't you sometimes feel that cancer is getting more and more common? And you are absolutely right in thinking so. Cancer incidence is increasing because of many reasons. And one of the main reasons is because we are living longer. Cancer is a disease of aging. This chart shows the number of new cancer cases diagnosed by different age groups. And we can see that very few cancer cases are diagnosed in children and young adults below 45 years of age. But worldwide, life expectancy is increasing all the time. We are living longer. In the 1900, the average lifespan is only about 31 years. 1950, this increased to 48 years. 2014, the worldwide life expectancy was 71.5 years. And in Singapore? Singaporeans live even longer. Singapore ranks third in the world for life expectancy. And the average Singaporean lives until 83.1 years. Now, we don't just have many people getting cancers. We also have many people dying from cancer. Cancer is the number one leading cause of death in Singapore. And one out of every three deaths is because of cancer. Now, we know cancer is a big problem. We know it's a growing problem. Are we curing cancer yet? Well, it's a very difficult question because cancer is not just one disease. Cancer is many diseases. And cancer types vary immensely. The skin looks nothing like the brain or the lung, so it's no big surprise that cancers at different sides of the body are intrinsically different. And just like how no two thumbprints or no two snowflakes are ever the same, no two cancers are ever the same. The figure on the left shows four different breast cancer tumors, A, B, C, and D, and how different they can look like under the microscope. And on a deeper level, the genetic level, every cancer is special and unique in its genetic sequence or barcode. And because no cancer is ever the same, there wouldn't be one cure to cure all cancers. It's more accurate to say that if cancer is 10,000 diseases, we will need 10,000 cures. But it's not just the heterogeneity, it's not just the variety that makes cancer so difficult to deal with. Another problem is that cancer is an enemy from within. Just like how purple minions are transformed from cute, yellow, friendly minions, cancer cells are transformed from our healthy cells. It is the similarity of the cancer cell to the healthy cell that makes it so difficult to target and treat and kill without harming all the different cells around it. And it doesn't help that cancer cells are so very smart. They can learn, they can evolve, and whatever doesn't kill them makes them stronger, makes them scarier. Now, we know that cancer is scary, we know it's a tough enemy, we know it's a smart enemy, but that doesn't mean we are not making progress in curing cancer. Forty years ago, a cancer diagnosis was a death sentence. The average patient lives one year after getting the bad news from their doctor. 
but 40 years later, with better treatment, with better understanding of the disease, patients are living longer. We have gained time. That's on average five more years of being alive. But not all cancers are the same. The improvement in survival for certain cancers are, of course, more dramatic than for others. Take for breast, ex breast cancer, for example. Patients now, on average, can expect to live a good 10 years after their diagnosis, a two-fold improvement over 40 years ago. And for bladder, colon, and rec rectal cancers, we are seeing as much as a 17-fold improvement in survivor. Even if you're not curing cancer, patients are living much, much longer. And with the next wave of scientific breakthroughs, there is hope that we can further improve cancer survivor. There is hope we can further extend lives. And this next wave of scientific breakthroughs may very well lie in what we call precision medicine, which has a lot to do with our genetic makeup. Precision medicine recognizes that every cancer is unique. So what do we do with such information? Well, in video games, to fight bosses or monsters, we exploit their individual vulnerabilities. If the boss or the monster is weak against fire or magic, we cast our spells and let it burn. To fight cancer cells, we also exploit vulnerabilities. We look for certain tumor characteristics or genetic markers that can tell us whether or not the tumor is weak against certain drugs or treatment. Ah, but that is not enough. Sun Tzu, a wise man from over 2,000 years ago, taught us that the art of war is won not just by knowing thy enemy, but also knowing thyself. Cancers are unique, but the patients are also unique. So to fight cancer, we not just have to study the cancer, we also have to study the patient. Traditional medicine sees all patients the same way. No patient is special, no one is unique. But precision medicine recognizes everyone as the individual they are. Everyone is different fundamentally in our genetic makeup. Unless you have an identical twin, it's almost impossible to find someone else with exactly the same genetic sequence as you do. So how do we make use of such information? Well, because by changing the focus from cancer to the individual healthy patient, we are not just treating the disease, we can prevent it from happening in the first place. Just like train breakdowns, in Singapore and elsewhere in the world, but particularly in Singapore, many things are preventable, and many things include cancer. To work on prevention, we can look for risk markers, and we've been in this business of looking for risk markers for a very long time. What we do is we do comparisons. We can compare people with cancer and people without cancer, and in this example, we, take, we look at lung cancer, and we look for unusual patterns. Here we see that smoking, is more common among people with lung cancer than without, and we make the link between smoking and lung cancer. In the age of genetics, we also do the same comparisons. We compare the genetic profiles of people with cancer and without cancer, and we also look for unusual patterns. And something truly wonderful happened to accelerate the progress in precision medicine and health, the very sharp cost reduction in cost of generating genetic data. In 2001, the first human genome was sequenced, and at that time, if you can afford to buy 200 to 300 units of HDB flat, the entire block, you could have afforded to sequence yourself. But fast forward 17 years, genome sequencing comes at a price that everyone can afford. At a 100,000-fold discount, just for you, you can now sequence your entire genome for the price of an iPhone X. And this sharp reduction in cost opened up many, many opportunities for precision medicine and health. Back in 2007, when I did my PhD, the first few breast cancer genetic risk studies were published. There were maybe two markers found by studying 2,000 women. But as research continued, as the barriers to entry became lower, as the genotyping and sequencing costs became cheaper, two markers became 200 markers, and 2,000 women became 200,000 women. From not knowing what information we can get from two markers to knowing exactly who are at a five-fold higher increased risk of breast cancer, 
we are painting the face of cancer. And it's not possible without international collaboration. To put things in perspective, less than 2,000 breast cancer cases are diagnosed every year in Singapore. To hit 200,000 women, it will take us 100 years to do the same research. But because cancer is truly borderless and without boundaries, researchers from all over the world are coming together to study the same disease. Together, we are humanity against cancer, as it should be for any other disease. And the ultimate aim is this. If we know all the variables, if we know all the risk markers, can we then, with certainty, predict exactly who will get cancer in the future? But knowledge without action is not enough. How do we make all these scientific studies count? How do we make a difference with all these risk markers? Well, the simple answer is to listen to your genes. While not all cancers are preventable, a third of them are. 14 million cancer cases are diagnosed worldwide every year, which means 4.7 million cancer cases can be prevented. How? Well, because many cancer risk factors are modifiable. If we know exactly who are at a higher risk of getting cancer, then we also know exactly who will benefit more from making healthier lifestyle choices. Tobacco, physical activity, diet, alcohol. Remember, many lives can be saved if we can just prevent cancer from happening in the first place. Although genes are very important, but it's not everything. Like what Batman reminds us, it's not who you are underneath, but what you do that defines you. It is always possible to take action. As to my final answer, during a very long cap ride, are we curing cancer yet? That will be, we are not quite there yet, but we are also no longer where we used to be. And with precision medicine, precision health, better treatment, better prevention, even if we do not cure cancer in this lifetime, we are certainly going to witness some amazing progress. Thank you.